He had a gun to my head. He had a gun to my head. Gun to my head. I remember this shit. I mean, it was like, this shit was like around three o'clock. I was just making my way back from a party in East Oakland. And I was staying at a warehouse over here on Peralta. It was a dope night, you know? I was really inspired, got to play some music. And I was feeling, I was feeling good. I decided to cut across under the bridge here. Cop sees me crossing the street right here, cutting under the bridge. Comes up on me, flashes his lights. Woo woo! Next thing you know, he's getting out of his car. He's um, patting me down, asking if I got any weapons. I was like, man, I'm cool, man. I don't have shit. I'm not doing shit. I just walked across the street. I apologize, if, whatever, if that was illegal. The next thing you know, this guy's throwing me on the ground and, and pulls his gun. And he has his gun on, he has his knee on my back and the gun on my neck. And he's like, I moved here to hunt you guys. He had a gun to my head. He had a gun to my head. Gun to my head. He had a gun to my head. I was already having a hard time being in America, but this shit just like took it over the top. You know, people are, are, are fed up. People are tired. Things are not necessarily getting better for African people who happen to live in America at this moment. When you talk about the racism and the, the, the white supremacy, the miseducation system, the, 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 the public fool system as I call it, the healthcare system. Uh, so this is, this is really what prompted me to like think about repatriation and getting the fuck out of America and investing in a place that actually welcomes me and is a benefit to my lifestyle that is healing for my lifestyle. Repatriation for me particularly means reconnecting our stories to our origins, our roots. I think repatriation has political connotations to it that not everyone would necessarily embrace. So I prefer to be called a digital nomad or location independent or wanderpreneur to being a repatriate. There are other people who made a conscious decision to say I'm leaving behind where I came from, America, and I am moving to a country that I think supports who I am, my wholeness, my being. So people in America know they're being poisoned, you know, they know um, about the chemtrails, they know the food is being poisoned, they know the cellular waves hurt them. They continue their work and their their lives because it's comfortable. Repatriation is people who actually left their um, place where they were born, came here, established a life for their self and their children, not only for their self and their children, but for their future generations. Like I also have very strong roots in black America. I have a 400 year history in America too. I don't feel like I'm a repatriate. I feel like I'm an African and I've returned home. I've been away and I've come back. And this is what made me leave America and has me looking back to Africa right now, looking back to my roots, to heal that, to go back, to reconnect because of this violence, because of this brutalization, you know what I mean? Because of this terror. The point of the right to abode was to implement the system to make it easier for us to return back to Africa. And in the most literal sense of the Ghanaian word Sankofa, it means to go back and return to your roots. Most of us are labeled, mislabeled on our documentation as Negroes and other things that take us out of a national standing, take away our nationality. Um, so I'm happy for him. You know, any of us that uh, reclaim ourselves, do study of who we are, where we came from, we should all be claiming nationality right about now. Mama, Mama Africa, I'm coming home, Mama. It's 
my understanding that there are at least five to 7,000 African Americans that are currently residing in Ghana, mostly in Accra and the Cape Coast Central Region. So in my eyes, that's revolutionary. And the work that they're doing is revolutionary, sharing about the greatness of Ghana. <laughs> Let me officially say you're welcome to Radio XYZ. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure, Sanru. So, who is Sanru? Sanru, let's see. I am deep into the music, the fashion, the dance, the healing arts. I feel an anxiousness about, about being here and doing the works I need to do. There's also a nervousness about how that will pan out. It was like not being able to take care of my family the way I wanted to take care of them really put me in a position where I felt like I had to leave in order to find an alternative where I could actually accomplish that. Like I'm bringing a couple, we'll look at it. Yeah. I know people, you know, Europe, Asia, America. So I want to let people know what I'm making, and then get the orders, and then we can we can go. My whole journey with fashion is to create a movement that's based on medicine, the medicine fashion. This is medicine fashion. So the fa the. People will wear this. They, they. I don't want chemicals. Lots of chemicals uh, in the. I want it to be natural. And the medicine fashion is the use of color to inspire, oh, to oh, 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 oh. bring positivity, mm -hmm. to you know. I want people to feel good when they put on these mm -hmm. garments. I want them to feel inspired, feel activated, feel powerful and confident. We'll start here. Yeah, we'll start here. Because <laughs> I have other samples too. I want to bring, but we'll start here and see what this Thank looks like and see how we can do this. Thank you so much. You're the fashion industry here in Ghana is booming. It's a big industry. The world is looking at Ghana because there's so many amazing artists and textiles here. So now it's our opportunity coming from the diaspora, especially from America, to bring the future. Whenever you think about Ghana, you think about Kwame Nkrumah. And Kwame Nkrumah, of course, was the first president of Ghana. And if you learn anything about Kwame Nkrumah, you know that Kwame Nkrumah was a, was a fan or a student of the Honorable Marcus Garvey. I mean, even if you look at the Ghanaian flag, you have a black star in the flag because Kwame Nkrumah was paying homage to Marcus Garvey and the Black Star Line and, and just the whole Back to Africa movement at that time. The way we see Pan-Africanism now is the idea of African people all over the world uniting and working with each other for the independence of Africa. We do have some place. It's not like we didn't come from anywhere. We did. We are originally from the motherland. Okay, so one of the first things that you do is when, once you buy your land, you put an identifying marker on the land that shows that the land has been purchased and that you own it. This is all a Prede overlook in the valley. Mm -hmm. And so my guess is that very soon, there'll be so many more returnees that will be living here. So we are standing on a land that I own which I will be joined very shortly by at least 13 to 15 other African Americans and other diasporans. For right now, this is the part that I own. Okay. And then um, there's another, um, she's an attorney from Massachusetts, uh -huh. um, Lamiko. She's like right in back of me. Okay. Um, Batu from DC is my next door neighbor. All right, so right now we are actually standing in front of my land. As you can see, it is pure bush. Um, I anticipate in a couple of years, a lot of this bush will be gone, not just simply my bush, but the area, meaning people are going to come and build. Have you decided what, what you're going to plant on your um, land? No, I haven't. I haven't even honestly thought about it. I'm just at the process where I'm like, I need to get my cornerstones down. We don't have money like that. Okay. So we have to go somewhere, get work, the funding. and get the funding. 
the important thing is when we come, it's not a mortgage, it's ours. Yeah. So we take our time, we design it, we build right. it the way that we want to. And pretty soon, all of this will be more large, beautiful homes with um, returnees. Our goal is to come here to be um, sustainable. By sustainable, I mean we do everything on the land. We um, we use the land for shelter. We use the land for, for food. As you look around now, you can see that there's corn growing in abundance. But we are also in the process right now of determining what other trees and what other foods and what other medicines that we're going to plant on our land. I have people come out here, do some permaculture, build some structures. And that can be a... A retreat, a gathering. Yeah. That's an idea. But when I come out here, I'm going to be a little older, and I ain't going to want to be bothered. This is the first sample. We just got it back. Looks beautiful. Nice hood, nice style, pockets. The next, uh, well, we have more samples to make, so we make more samples, and then um, we post this today. We see how everybody likes it, and then we get orders. The drumming and the dancing is an ancient, ancient code. It's an ancient language that's connected to past, present, and future. It's a celebration, a return, and also like a full circle healing. African American repatriation is, is those spirits of those ancestors who were taken away, coming back home to, to reconnect to their past, to their history. Cape Coast, the Cape Coast dungeons and the Elamina Castle are places where the slaves were held and transported out of Africa. When I was in the dungeon, I could feel that helplessness. Like I could feel, I could feel the, the sadness but also the unmovable faith that this will pass somehow. But I could feel the deep, deep suffering, and deep um, pain also. I could feel a lot of spirits not rested. That trauma is generational, and this is what's happened to a lot of us who have gone through that trauma of being stolen or displaced and the only way that we can heal our roots is by looking at where we come from we don't know our story we don't know where we're going growing up in Virginia it was really dope it was really amazing, man. Everybody knew each other in my town, the town of Vienna. Everybody knew the Walkers, you know? Our family was huge, and our extended family was huge. The Walkers, the Monroes. I haven't seen my family this time for about six years. So the last six years, I've basically divorced myself from society, and I've been living abroad globally as an artist. I uh, went to three continents, and I was investigating uh, sustainable places to live. On my trip to Morocco, I ended up having a, um, having a call from my mother telling me that uh, there was a trace of my ancestors to Ghana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, this sparked my curiosity and I, we started digging deeper and we come to find out that my ancestor was stolen at 14 from Ghana. Stolen? Stolen! Uh, some old school registrar was found where it had evidence of my family and a connection to Ghana. So that sparked my whole journey. My name is Reverend Dr. Dolores Washington, 
And these are my grandparents, my mother's mother and father, John and Sarah Monroe. Sunroe is my cousin on the Monroe side. Uh, I also had a cousin who lived in Pennsylvania. Um, and she also was a history buff about our family. And so she gave me information about them being from Ghana, that Rufus, who was my mother's grandfather, was a king. And that, um, of course, John was Rufus' only son. But at 14, they sold him into slavery, and he ended up in Charlottesville. So we are currently here at James Monroe Plantation where we are tracing my ancestor, John Monroe, who was supposedly a slave, brought here when he was 14 years old. James Monroe was uh, the fifth president of the United States. There are some indications from Monroe's writings and actions that he did object to slavery and was, um, was uh, concerned with the, the moral implications of it, um, but he in fact did not ever um, uh, free his slaves wholesale. When I was looking in the book of names of slaves that Sour showed me, it brought up a sense of mystery about what their lives were like, what they had to go through, what they endured, the pains and the sufferings of the separations of the families and being split apart and being beaten and being sold and being oppressed. and. Right now we're just connecting the dots and finding out the migration and the developments and what happened in the story so that we can put together this puzzle. It's likely that if their name was Monroe and they came to Charlottesville, that this is the place that they came Me to. Too. Our goal is to tell a real truthful history in all its richness in the the, the painful parts um, included, but really to move forward and share a future together based on truthful telling and complete telling of all the stories of the early United States. I'm 87.7% Sub-Saharan African. Hmm. Okay. Uh, European, 9.7. Uh, East Asian and Native American, 1.2. Western Asian and North African, 0 0.6. Researching this information and grounding this information, not just for me, but for my grandmother, for my mother, for my cousins, for, for the next generations, it's crucial that we heal this. So for me right now, the healing, the, to complete my healing, is to go back to my roots, roots. Go back in my own story, because it's something that I haven't known for 43 years. It's very cellular. The memories of, of riding up the driveway at the plantation was just like arriving at the, the door of no return. I felt the same energy, like I've been here before, I've done this. I mean, me reclaiming my power, me coming back here, and also going to the plantation is a complete full circle and a complete acknowledgement of what they went through. After Alamina, I started chanting and I started singing. Beyond um, the shackles, beyond everything that happened, I felt like I wanted to express freedom, that we are free. Regardless of what we've gone through, we are free. In terms of a young African American that's looking to come to Ghana because they've heard about the right, um, right to abode, it's not as clearly defined as you may think that it is. There are a number of people that um, come here thinking that they automatically will you know, gain Ghanaian citizenship and that process is not direct, it's not straightforward. Repatriation is a good thing for every individual 
it's good to know your roots and your and your ancestors but coming to a place like ghana you have to have the means and amendment to make you to be able to fit in the in the economic crisis that the world is facing now but i also would encourage young people people who are in active service in any form of discipline whether it's, it's broadcasting whether it's documentary whether it's military whether it's business africa needs sons and daughters to return and be able to contribute to the to the development of this continent why leave somewhere that you've already been your whole life to try to do something else? That's just restarting what they already did. When I first came to Ghana, I had my first bar party. All the repatriate community came out, and you could really see how much they really just enjoy being around each other. They enjoyed the conversations. They enjoyed having this time. And so it let me know that we need that. We need that building time. We need that time to just relax and be in a safe space. Yeah. Bring it back. So you would have to have some kind of rainy day fun. Yeah. I tell everyone that right. about one in ten listen, okay. and they end up have to go back or they have to start begging on the internet and those oh. kind of things. <laughs> yeah, when Empress was was telling me don't be the don't be the person coming here on the internet, you know, asking people for money, uh, I was like, yo, that's me right now, you know. That I was like, I've been, I've been putting those shouts out to my community and even, you know, being uh, frustrated with my community and displaying that. What I would say to anybody who wants to make this journey, who wants to reconnect with the land of their ancestors, that one, you need to have a plan. You just can't jump up and come unless you got it like that. I mean, if you got the finances to be able to sustain you in that manner, that's one thing. But the average one of us coming does not. <laughs> yeah. Please come prepared. Ooh. Please come prepared. Can we get you? <laughs> mm. I came to Oakland in 1996 from DC. Oakland has a rich history of movement from the Black Panthers, the Bruce Lee, Hells Angels, hippies. You have the riots of Berkeley that stopped the Vietnam War. You know what I mean? So it's a place of progressive movement and uh, free thought. Basically what started to happen was I started to feel every time somebody would get shot or killed by the police across America. And I basically started feeling, I started seeing that these sacrifices were meant to disturb us energetically and actually cause us to shut down so that we don't mobilize, we don't organize ourselves. Just returning back to America has brought up a lot of deep wounds for me as far as feeling like um, I failed here. I gotta figure out a way to get this money together to, to really sustain myself. Um, while I'm in Ghana and create this fashion that can open up this industry. He needs to be clear with himself about what he is doing. When you're clear about that, you don't get lost. But you specifically came back here for something. No, oh, well, I came back here to reconnect to my relations, but also to raise money to help support the mission to Ghana. So when I got back to America, I was putting it out that I needed money for the investment into the fashion. I needed certain things to happen while I was there. You do not show up to the Bay Area and try to pull a week's worth of events out of your ass on a Tuesday with no other groundwork set. You don't. I couldn't ground a, an event space to, to, to call people in. Um, we ended up having this barbecue out in San Lorenzo with Town Futurist, but for me, I was really conflicted with that because it's in San Lorenzo, it was on a Saturday. I wasn't sure if people were even gonna come out there. And this is a celebration for my brother Sanru for coming back to the States on his two year journey. You know, there's flyers and stuff that need to go out. There's social media promotion that needs to go out. There's all this other stuff that needs to go out before the show actually happens. And all of that falls on usually one person or two people, which is you, myself and like one other person. 
and what we've had a challenge is between he and I is he doesn't want to do any of that. He just wants to show up and be an artist. And within that, it created some strain between us because his ex expectations on me and trying to hurry up and do it now, let's get it done, wasn't realistic because he wasn't here to support the things that needed to get done. The Bay loves you. You have a lot of family here. I don't want you to keep coming back if you're just gonna like bitch and complain about it. Creatively, I think he's amazing. Just like the way his mind works in terms of as an artist, as a freestyler, as a singer, as a poet, he's amazing. Sometimes I hear a man on a journey and other times I hear a man that's going to lead the world to the mothership so we can return to paradise and home. So this is what we're dealing with right now is people putting possessions before soul putting possessions before their evolution, the soul's evolution. You know what I mean? Because we're so tricked to be like, oh, we need this shit. We need all this material shit, so. These doubts that rise in my head about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it here are old patterns that I wish to heal. You know, old thoughts, old feelings of power, powerlessness, um, old feelings of not being able to sustain myself or take care of the reality the way I, I need to. I put it out to my community like, look, I just need a little bit. I just need a dollar from like a thousand people. I feel like if I get that blessing from a thousand people, like one dollar, I feel like the blessing of that thousand people will multiply into millions. It'll be exponential because the power of us giving and supporting someone's dream, when we do that, it activates other people's dreams. It gives other people uh, courage and confidence to go follow their dreams. And people actually started giving me a dollar. These blessings actually shifted something within me. When I started hearing people say, hey, I got you. Here's one dollar. Here's three thirty-three. Here's seven seventy-seven. Here's five dollars. You know, people are actually giving more. I'm asking for one, but now people are giving more. So it's, I'm, it's deep, because a thousand dollars here in Ghana is a lot of money. Now that I have my final samples, I feel really good with what I accomplished here, which was to start the line. You know, I have many, many designs, but I wanted to do six to eight designs that could really set the pace. What's next exactly is that I'm going to Berlin and Amsterdam to sell the clothes and also to get orders so that I can start production here in Africa. So I have to go harness some money, get some money together, get some investors, get people excited about it. Hello. How you doing? Being away from my daughter, I've missed a lot. I think it's been the hardest thing for me to be away from her because I was with her straight for 10 years. Here I am leaving the country for two to three years. I haven't seen her in a year and a half, two years. And it's just like really hard, you know, really hard to um, leave your family and then come back and see what they're going through and, and the struggles that they're going through and see how you could actually help that. But since you're not present, you can't, you know? I said I would love to talk to you more, if possible. I said I, I, said I would love to talk to you more. Um, I had to come back to Ghana to kind of realize what I was participating in by isolating myself away from my family and my friends. Repatriation has changed for me because uh, without my family, it means nothing. I have realized that 
the repatriation that I thought uh, I was getting myself into is definitely not the one that I'm vibing now. It's basically shifted in the ways that has opened me up to the reality that I have to stay connected to America. I have to grow America as well as I grow the energy here. I have to stay connected to my roots. I have to have multiple streams of income. Um, I have to create a plan, an intricate plan with others so that that root structure can be really solid and really strong, you know? Sometimes I think we want to cross the finish line so bad that we forget how bad we don't want to be without all the people that we've experienced on the journey. So um, basically, I am moving back to America. Um, okay, for sure, or is this like um, an idea? Or? Well, this is my latest revelation is that I need to be close to you. Okay. My plan now is to establish my network in Ghana, create these connections, and start coming back um, periodically. Running away from my responsibilities, I would say, you know, maybe part of that is true. You know, I, I, I really wasn't present for a lot of my responsibilities after a while. But there's no guidebook on, on surviving a genocide or thriving through a, gen a genocide. To those people who feel that I'm crazy, just know that it takes crazy to really go against and break down systems. The majority are going one way, and some of us crazy people are going the other way. So for those folks who, who are thinking about it, I say do it. You know, definitely have a plan. You know, definitely have a way to, to, to bring in income. You know, definitely uh, understand that colonialism is real and neocolonialism is real as well. So don't come expecting a paradise, but come expecting to love this land and to contribute to the betterment of this particular place. God is inviting us to come home. Uh, it's offering us the culture that we lost when we were brutally taken out of here. However, with whatever it is that Ghana's offering us, Ghana is expecting us to come to the table with something. Breaking out of America or leaving the plantation. A lot of what I thought was binding me or controlling me was actually in my mind. So when you start to realize that the plantation isn't necessarily a physical place, it's literally where you are within yourself. I love Ghana. I think it is a fantastic country. I am happy that I moved here. It's one of the best decisions I ever made for myself and for my children. But it is not a panacea. There are different struggles that an individual will have to uh, deal with when, when they come here. This is our heaven on earth and so I came um, in search of that. My story is deep and it's a story of, of a resilient people who are powerful and connected to this earth no matter what. And if we don't deal with the things that our ancestors have gone through, we can't even get to our shit. So all of us have that opportunity to go inside of ourselves and unlock that. And I think that's the biggest gift we can give our ancestors is to come full circle.